So here we are, continuing the 25th anniversary of Flying Colors Comics and other cool stuff. The cool stuff today, besides the comics and t-shirts, is... Who's going to be here? Uh, that oh, Pete? some guy named Jim Lee. Yeah, I think I heard yeah. of him. So you're all going to see him in an exclusive interview. Joe Field will talk one-on-one -on -one with Jim Lee. Be on the lookout for that. So, you ready? I'm, uh, I'm you brought all this comic book yeah, team ready to sign it. Let's yes. do it. Jim Lee at Flying Colors Comics. Welcome everybody to Flying Colors for our 25th anniversary celebration with Jim Lee. Yeah. Jim, first off, I want to thank you for being here. This is an uh, uh, an honor to have you back. 25 years after your first store signing, how does it feel to be back? Uh, honestly. I don't know if uh, for you, but I, it really feels like I was here like three years ago. I mean, it <laughs> went by so fast, didn't it, Joe? I mean, yeah. really, uh, it was my first store signing. I was living in the Bay Area uh, in Berkeley, and uh, I heard there was a store that was opening nearby, and, and uh, I don't know how we got in contact. with. This is pre-internet, pre-email. I don't even know how it happened. I'll tell honestly. you how. There were smoke signals or something yeah. over the hill. Said, <laughs> Comic books. <laughs> so Before Flying Colors opened... Right. I was uh, one of the guys helping to run WonderCon. That's right. That's right. And uh, and you were a young artist at WonderCon. Right. And one of my uh, uh, minor claims to fame is that I introduced Jim Lee right, to, to Stan, Stan That's Lee. right. I remember that. That's right. That's right. Okay. Do, what, what do you remember about that? I, you know what? I probably was just in awe. Uh, I mean, on, honestly, meeting someone like Stan, I mean, he's, he's a titan in the industry. He was so influential in my career. I, I, it's one of the things where you kind of black out or white out just because it's just like you're staring right into the sun itself kind of thing. So, <laughs> you know, Stan is an oversized personality. And, so. and, and now people uh, feel the same about you. No, no, yeah. no. Stan is completely – I still, like, am awestruck when I, I see Stan. I mean, I'm much more comfortable around him and, and – hung out with him socially but he's just such a an icon and, and such an inspiration and just so much fun and energy it really is like a, a ball of kinetic energy that that has a name stan lee but yeah. he really is just an amazing guy and he's definitely been good for the industry for the last oh, fantastic yeah, five years absolutely. or whatever yeah uh okay so uh let's talk about the the early days yeah. um um i have uh uh someone let me borrow this okay. um uh and and I'm, I'm bringing it out to only to uh uh, cause you no end of consternation. Um, this is <laughs> right. <laughs> this is your first work, right? That's right, right. Uh, Samurai Santa. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, Samurai Santa from Solson Publications. What was this? Uh, eighty six or eighty seven? Uh, something like that. I want to say it was uh, eighty six. Okay. Um, but it literally was the very first uh, work I had done uh, and gotten paid for. It was. Uh, a small publisher, they're out of business now, but Solson and these uh, Don Sacris was a comic book sh shop owner in St. Louis who I had met. Um, uh, he had already kind of broken into the business, and I was trying to get in, and uh, he had this assignment come his way and said, hey, do you want to do finishes over my breakdowns? I think it paid like, I want to say like... 25 bucks a page I can't even remember what it was but it was it was awesome because you know 25 bucks is better than no bucks right and uh, so uh, we I think we did it on like typewriter paper or something yeah. equivalent to that and I did it I don't know I want to say in a weekend but I think it was probably like five or six days and uh, it was just fun to do I mean you know I liked Don I liked working with him it was a great way of uh, you know it was just you know when you're trying to break in just anything is a positive thing thing and uh, it, it showed me that hey maybe there is a light at the end of this tunnel where had you been at that point uh, um, uh, you were in st. Louis your family's from st. That's right. Louis I was, yeah so I was in college uh, in the East Coast had moved back in with my parents I had given them the stunning news that after four years of, of college and getting a degree I said you know what I don't want to go to medical school I let's just rewrite the whole game plan I'm gonna break into comics and they're like <laughs> what <laughs> excuse me and uh, that would th that didn't go over so well but uh, after a bunch of uh, discussions, and by discussions I mean very heated fights, uh, they finally <laughs> relented and, and gave me an opportunity really uh, to, to uh, live at home and try to break into comics. And so that came about, I want to say, um, in that first year, um, but I broke in at Marvel shortly thereafter, so it was right around the same time. I can't remember, you know, it's very fuzzy to me, yeah. but uh, that was the first thing. And, and those guys at that comic book shop were great because I think one of them was... Um, 
Rick Burkett, who has done a lot of work for DC, and he was like the guy that had already break, broken in. A lot of the other guys were working for small publishers, but it was just a great group of people to hang out with and you know, just get their feedback, because there's nothing online to kind of tell you, like, this is how you break into comics. This is what you need to learn. This is how you do it. These are people to contact. You didn't even know how to send anything to anyone at the companies, because the addresses were not, obviously, you know, in, in plain sight. So uh, it was a mystery of how one got into the business, and it was a mystery uh, just even meeting people in the business. So having met those guys was a big uh, sort of milestone in my career. So uh, then what brought you to the West Coast after, shortly after Yeah, uh, I'd always wanted to live in California. I had visited a friend of mine actually here in Berkeley. Uh, he was going to grad school here, and I just remember walking around, and it was just, uh, it was just a carnival. <laughs> kind of, I was like, wow, this is really different. Uh, and, a little bit uh, different than St. Louis. Yes, different than St. Louis, different than the East Coast. I really yeah. had never experienced anything like that before, and uh, the food was awesome. Uh, I just remember it was like some Thai restaurants were just fantastic, and and I, you know, I just really was bitten by the, the California bug. And uh, I had been out to California before because a lot of my relatives lived down in L.A. and still do. And so I'd really visited that part of the of the state, but not never really the Northern California. So I came out, really liked it, and decided to move out here. And um, uh, my editor at Marvel at the time was Carl Potts, and Carl Potts had actually brought a lot of new people into the business, one of which was uh, Mike Mignola, mm -hmm. and he lived in Oakland at the time, and Art Adams, too. They lived in the same yeah. apartment complex. And so Carl, bless his heart, called these guys up. They, they didn't know who I was, and said, hey, this guy wants to move out to California, to, to Oakland, the Bay Area. Can you, can you put him up? And, uh, and Mike, I don't, uh, you know, he said yes. <laughs> and so I actually camped out on Mike Mignola's couch for like five days while I walked. I actually, I took the bus because I didn't have a car uh, and, and just kind of combed the area looking through one ads looking for, um, you know, places to rent. Mm -hmm. And I eventually found a house in Berkeley off College in Ashby. They had a, a room to rent. I think it was like 300, 350, you know, a month. And they actually had a wooden uh, shed in the backyard. The owner at the time wanted to be an architect or was interested in it, but he kind of gave it up. But they had a drafting table and all that equipment. So I actually had like a little mini office that they allowed me to use. And I lived there for about two years working in comics. And, uh, um, yeah, so a lot of the stuff I did, the X-Men, was done, done here, very close to here. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, we... We moved down to Southern California. You moved there, yeah. uh, and uh, that was sort of pre Wildstorm. But it was it, we had Comics Express. We uh, there was uh, there were uh, um, yeah. There was a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I, when I got into comics, yeah. I, I mean, I, I obviously started as a penciler, but I was very curious about other parts of business. And actually, I, I'm sure I've talked to you about retailing. And oh yeah, I was really curious about. Um, all facets from from the from the the retailer to the distributor to the publisher like who did what and why and and how how did this whole business kind of operate because again back then there was very few resources to find out about this and the only way you could find out was by sitting down and asking people questions right. uh, so I moved down to the to uh, San Diego because my first job was on Alpha Flight at Marvel and my anchor was Will Spartacio and he was close buddies with Scott Williams because they both lived in Hawaii at the time they both lived in San Diego at that moment and uh, um, Will, I called up Will just because he was the anchor on my first assignment, and you know I just asked him all these questions about working in the business, and and he invited me to come join them at San Diego Comic Con. I'd never been, and so I flew out to San Diego. They put me up in their house, and then at the con we all rented a room. Uh, this was back in '87, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my first Comic Con. I've been going ever since. So that I've gone what 20 six years in a row yeah. since but uh literally uh we hit it off and we just started talking about opening a studio there was a, a studio book i think uh barry windsor smith and jeff jones and michael luda right they put yeah. out this awesome book oh yeah just fantastic work and not that we had any uh we, we definitely would not measure up to that level uh, of talent but we really had looked we really admired the fact that people got together and worked together and we really that really appealed to us so we decided to open up a studio. We rented a one-bedroom apartment in Mira Mesa in San Diego, and that's why I moved down there. I literally had a suitcase and uh, a car, and uh, you know, um, that was back in I want to say '91, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember visiting down there and thinking how great it was going. This romantic notion of going into this comic book studio and it was a one bedroom apartment with right. pizza boxes sure. and, and, yeah 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 it, it was it was we were it was not zoned for for work right, right? Yeah. yeah but it was uh don't tell anyone we have a studio <laughs> yeah, here exactly and then we moved to a two bedroom uh, apartment uh 
and it was like five fifty. We were splitting the rent, you know, splitting the rent, and I think we bought a fax machine. That was like a big, like, yeah. like wow, we have a fax. We're like, we're professionals now, like you know, like we had pagers, like we're all like, you know, like rocking it. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was really. It was again just a learning experience, and Comics Express was really. And we started like you know people. There was a, a, a burgeoning marketplace for signed comics, so we started doing signed comics. And I'll tell you, every time we went in and did something beyond just the drawing of comics. We realized how much work it was, whether it was retail oh, yeah. or, you know, say, you know what, we'll let other people handle this. We'll just draw the comics. We'll, we'll sign and then we'll let them handle the marketing and selling of it all. Um, but it was good. It was really, um, again, working with those guys on X-Men and I think Wilson was working on X-Factor at the time. It was just a great way of making deadlines. It was a great way of focusing on the work, of, of pushing each other artistically. Um, and uh, we, I learned a lot, and uh, we really just had a great time working in uh, that kind of mini office space. And that really was the roots of what became uh, Amish Studios and eventually Wildstorm and, and, and Image Comics. Okay, so now uh, uh, somewhere in there is X-Men number one. Sure, yeah. 1991. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We did a huge event here. Uh, we did the signed comics. We teamed yeah. with Comics Express and all of that. We raised a lot of money for charity. It was a I really cool... I think one of those giant oversized checks, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right, that was, yeah. that was pretty cool. We, we, do, yeah. Uh, we did. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and, uh, and we still have that, and it has a Wolverine sketch. Oh, on does it? it? Okay, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> I should have brought that out right. for you. Um, <laughs> but how does it feel to be... The artist, the the main guy on the number one selling comic book of all time. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's an honor, you know. Uh, I guess we're in the Guinness uh, Book of World Records. Um, yeah, it's. I, I don't think about it too often, so it's not something that, and, and particularly in our business, it's not something that you tout too much because you're really as important or as commercial as your last work, right? So yeah. I, you know, I mean, I. I I, I assume some of you guys bought that book, but I would never rely on that. Like, you know, you should be more whatever <laughs> because I did this book that sold eight. Like, yeah. it's this cool honor to have. Uh, but to me, it's I'm like so focused on like, well, how's my next project going to do, and like, what can we do to make this, you know, the biggest project or the, the best project possible. So, uh, it's a cool thing to have in your in your again, you know, in the, in the record books. But then day uh, I, I've n never been one to kind of look back so much as as kind of forward yeah. and thinking about what can we do that's cooler than what we've done in the past. Oh, yeah. Right? So. Well, I think uh, that kind of brings us um, to some of the things that you're working on now. Um, and uh, before we do that, just when you talk about talking to different people in the business to learn different facets sure. of it, uh, retailing, distribution, right, and right. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Joe was really my conciliary for a long time. <laughs> just FYI. You know, like, I was a, a kid that was very headstrong, thought he knew everything. And Joe was a great and sounding board. And I pretended board. to. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was a fantastic sounding board and gave me such great advice. I, I learned so much from all the discussions we had about all facets of the business. And really, again, I mean, there was very few resources available. So talking to people that were smart, that had experience, that were straight with you, I mean, those were, I mean, that's like gold, you know, and uh, I really... Um, appreciate and thank you for that oh yeah well i i thank you for just hanging think, in there with me all these years <laughs> um i but uh, one of the things that i've uh, long been impressed with is that sort of insatiable appetite for knowledge about what makes things work uh why sure. things don't work and trying to make things better and so now we have uh we have this very dynamic market right now it is it's crazy uh, yeah it's crazy and, good it's yeah. crazy good yeah. i think it's probably the best market it's been uh, uh, that I can remember. Sure, uh, the, yeah. uh, it's definitely the healthiest market. Yes, uh, and um, there might have been more dollars back in the '90s, but I think if you look at the lay of the land and what's causing a lot of the, the increase in sales, I think we're in a much healthier place and much more sustainable place than we were back in, in, in you know during the speculator boom. What would you attribute some of that to? Well, I think most people attribute it to. Uh, or you mean today? Uh, yeah. Things being healthier yeah. today. I I think uh, a the comic books are a lot better. Uh, I think that is the root of all success. Is like you got to have good content. I don't care what you put on the cover, how you sell it, what platform you sell it, um, whether it's tied into a major motion picture or a video game. If the comic book is not a good read, it's not a good experience, then we're doomed. And I think if you look back at what was produced in the '90s and what's produced now, we have a. I think it's more writer driven, uh, or there's actually more of a. I, I would say it's more writer driven. Years ago, I think there's a healthier balance now between writer and artist, whereas mm -hmm. back in the 90s, I think it was very artist-driven, and I think that 
probably alienated a lot of people that were into the stories, which I think were most of the people. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things. So the, the actual content is a lot better. I think there are more uh, creators that are awesome than the were the talent pool is stronger and can sustain more more content I think uh, we actually now have better abilities to promote the work we're doing I mean um, obviously it's covered more in, in newspapers and on TV than it was back in the 90s in the 90s it was a, a huge boom but it was very limited to the people that were very focused on comics and cards I don't know how much of it got out to the real world other than maybe like the death of Superman and certain certain instances um, the New York Times covers comic books today you know right. uh, USA Today does regular coverage of the, of the industry there are a lot of people I think from the 90s and, and the 80s that are older that are into comics laps fans that have come, come back and that kind of coverage has rekindled their interest in comics so that's really good I think we have a more diverse range of, of fans than we had back in the 90s um, and I think the fact that so many people are aware of our characters through the movies and games gives us a really a huge adjacent pool of fans that we can try to tap into through our marketing and promotional efforts to get them to become comic book fans. Well, and and uh, over the last ten or eleven years, we've had this just dramatic. Uh, rise in geek culture and sure and, and that's, that's definitely right. not a slam on uh, geek or anything like that it's just that we were OG's it, original geeks, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> you know um, it's 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 really we, we've, right. we've kind of taken over the world the sure geek. it really is it's a frightening alternate reality that one that I would never have uh, <laughs> presumed would ever happen seriously I got into comics thinking you know what this is going to be a niche business and this is something I'm going to have incredible personal pleasure doing because I love comics, I love storytelling, um, but it's something that I will forever have to explain to my parents and relatives what it is that I do and who these characters are. And now I've got my wife's grandparents, to, you know, ask me questions about, you know, Wolverine or who's going to play Batman. I'm like, really? This is what you want? Like, don't we, you know, should we be car carving the turkey or something? Like, well, you know, I can't so. tell you how many times that we've gone to Libby and I have gone to different events uh -huh. uh, for our daughter schools or whatever, yeah. or weddings. You're the comic book guy, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, right. and yeah, and since I'm the comic book guy, right. all the conversation comes. Sure. They don't want to talk about engineering or yeah. being a doctor yeah. Yeah. or yeah. any of that kind of. Yeah. It's a, what's going on with the X Right, right. Oh, you know what's Batman doing these sure. days? You right, know? Um, and I think that's that. Who would have ever thought Iron Man would be the phenomenon? You know what I'm saying? Like oh, it's yeah. just it's just mind boggling. So it, it's it's amazing, and I you know yeah. Let's it's, keep it going. That, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to take some questions from the audience. I had some people prepare some uh, some questions, and uh, I'm just going to uh, go through a few of these and see see how they go. How do you feel about having sold uh, your piece of image? Uh, now that it has lots of new big comics, oh, uh, it's my single biggest regret. No, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm very tongue in cheek here with my answers. Uh, I I knew fully what I was doing when I when I sold my interest in Image. Uh, you know, uh, I I I'm very I'm very proud actually to see the resurgence in their popularity. Uh, I think they've taken a really smart approach to create their own books. It's a very different type of company, and the kind of work they they sell is very different than what was happening in the '90s. Uh, so I, I I look at it with a lot of pride, and I'm still friends with all the uh, Image partners. So uh, you know, God bless. Uh, you know, I, I, I to me at that time it was not the place for me to be. There were cer certain things I wanted to do with my company, my future, my personal life, and, uh, you know, I ended up selling to DC, which ended up being a, a great uh, uh, opportunity for me to really grow into something completely different, and that was to eventually become co-publisher. It's not something I intended to do when I started at DC, but, um, again, I learned so much working at DC. I mean, they had incredible infrastructure, a, a different approach to the business. Uh, so many decades of experience in guys like Paul Levitz and Bob Wayne, and um, you know, it was just again another level of just learning about the business and and the art form, and uh, uh, that would not have happened if I had remained with Image. Right. Are there any characters from your uh, from your time with uh, Wildstorm that uh, you would really love to see break out now that they're part of DC? Um, yeah, you know, I think. Uh, Gen 13 to me, it, it, a bunch of characters that were uh, really popular in the 90s and not just because it was a speculator boom. I think there was inherent interest in the characters. I think the concept was probably the strongest of all the things that we launched out of Wildstorm. Um, certainly the most affable or likable characters. 
Um, and I don't see a lot of characters like that. I mean, things tend to be kind of grim and yeah. serious these days, and having characters that are a little more lighthearted, uh, I think there's there's room for that. So I would love to see that reintroduced through the DC Universe. That said, I think you got to wait for the right creative team, because we have launched a lot of Wildstorm characters through the new 52, and they haven't really gained that kind of traction that we would want. It. Right. Okay, so I don't know who wrote this question, but uh, do you plan to get together with Frank Miller again and maybe finish All Star? I, I just saw and Frank uh, two and a half weeks ago. So yeah, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, I would love to finish it. I, you know, he is he is obviously a superstar. He's a guy that is in tremendous demand. He uh, is working on Sin City two. The the three hundred prequel is coming out. Uh, he's got his own comic book project that he's working on. Um, uh, yeah, I mean the guy is so busy, and uh, but I would love to to finish that because he has a tremendous story, and uh, it's funny when it first when All Star Batman and Robin first came out, it had kind of mixed reviews. Some people loved it, some people just really didn't care for it. Right. Um, and but over the years, um, I get that's that's the one project I get asked the most about, and uh, I would love to finish it because Frank has a great story to to tell. So it's just a matter of time. So Okay, so uh, Ryan Sullivan asks, uh, who's been your favorite writer to work with over the years? Wow, uh, that's a tough... <laughs> it's like asking who your favorite child is, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I have a lot of choices. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I love them all for different reasons, okay? So, again, I, I love working with great writers because um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I would ever write a series, but I love thinking about what a writer thinks about when they craft a story. I love the creative process of that. And so when you work with different writers, they all work differently. Some people work from the ending and work backwards. Some people really just focus on the characters and it's more character driven than plot driven. Um, a guy like Frank is very, um, uh, he's very visual because obviously he would just draw exactly what he writes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you read his scripts, it's all there and it's very succinct, um, very crisp and, and clear. And uh, to me, it's all about learning how to tell be better stories. And the, the, you always learn from working with people that are better than you at whatever craft you're trying to learn. And, and that's really been my impetus. So there's really not one favorite. It's all about like different things I've learned from different people. Um, from like Jeff Loeb, just all about like how to use so many characters and kind of juggle it in a storyline that is coherent and moves towards some sort of climax. Um, again, Frank with the, the graphic storytelling. Jeff Johns, is, his stories are filled with so much heart and uh, so character driven. So um, there's so many different things I've learned from each of them. And Scott Snyder is kind of fun to work with. Scott now, Snyder right? is awesome to work with <laughs> on, on Suit Rain on Chain because he, uh, he comes from a literary background so his work has so many thematic levels and layers. He's always thinking of beats three issues down the line and things are set things are 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 done in an issue that set up something else not necessarily in terms of plot but in terms of theme and um everything has meaning from the shapes of doorways to symbols i mean it's really um been a lot of fun working with him wow. on superman unchained yeah okay uh jack Lorkowski asks asks uh, how long did it take to make your first comic now was samurai santa your first comic i or, you know because yeah. I, i've seen some stuff online that you did when you were 12 years yes, old yes that's right yeah i have i have i have drawn uh <laughs> I've never drawn a finished comic, though, when I was a kid, before I turned pro. I did not have that discipline. I honestly think that's the thing that really divides people that want to be comic artists and those that succeed. I mean, aside from the inherent talent or ability to draw, I think it's it's the discipline to sit down and do it uh, day in, day out. To draw 22 pages at, what, five or six panels a page, that's about 120 illustrations. And um, you got to do six of those a day. And it's... Uh, it, and, and so you could do it maybe one day, two days, but like 20 days, 22 days in a row, mm -hmm. and then you take a couple of days off, and then you got to do it again. It is there's a grind element to it. It's like running a marathon with no end, and um, so that's a big part of it. But I would say, um, when I was a kid, I loved the idea of creating and drawing comic books, but I would rarely finish. Like even panels, I would just kind of draw what interests me, and then ah, the background, ah, whatever, not yeah. so important, right? Yeah. You know, like, and. Uh, and I, I, I really thought people would give me a job. I remember when I was, I want to say I was like 12, but maybe I was 10. So, somewhere in there, I, I drew sketches and mailed them off to Marvel, thinking they would literally give me a job. And these were drawn on, <laughs> tight, you know, like on, on the blue line paper. Uh huh. Half, you know, it was like a drawing of the Hulk that was maybe half done. It just was the head and shoulders, and it just kind of tapered off nowhere. Else. This is better than half the books they're, they're printing. Like, <laughs> surely they're going to call me. I was literally waiting for them to call me and offer me a job. So, um, yeah, anyway, so. 
once you move from that kind of, um, I don't know what, uh, uh, um, dementia yeah, to, yeah. To, to <laughs> right. whatever to to reality i think that's and that happens at a certain age i think when you, you mature and you realize you know what i've got a lot of work to do i have to be super disciplined about this this is a job i have to be super focused and i have to provide everything on that page right i have to do all the stuff i don't want to do and are you still doing most of your drawing in the middle of the night i, I mostly yeah yeah because I mean, that's the way kids start sure yeah staying up yeah, until yeah. all hours drawing yeah. and I, I would well when i was a kid i would draw on the floor i, I have moved up to a table since then <laughs> right but i would like like you know like i, I, I you know I would, my parents had a station wagon we would drive around the country during the summers uh you know, touring throughout the U.S., my parents were you know sightseeing, and uh, we'd stop in the comic book shops in different cities. I'd get one or two comics just to shut me up. You know, or they bought yeah. one or two for me to kind of keep me quiet, and I would have paper in the back of the station wagon with the comics. I would be drawing, you know, lying down on my stomach, and just that's how I spent um, my summers. Right, so. Um, yeah, not so good on the back these days, but you know. Okay, so Bobby Shiota asks, yeah. uh, let's see, of all the covers you've drawn, do you have a favorite? Um, do you have favorite covers by anybody all time? Sure. And your favorite character to draw? Right. Uh, I think some of those Dark Knight Returns covers are some of my favorites. Iconic. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think the second one that just went up to auction, and yeah. I, I would have bid on it if it was <laughs> half a million dollars cheaper. Uh, <laughs> so it was uh, the one of this gnarly Batman. I mean, it's just awesome. He's blocky. I just remember when I was uh, when I was like 20 when that came out. I think it was just so different and so visceral and, and so impactful um so that one is uh, stuck with me and typically it's the covers that i'm sure your covers are the ones from your childhood that sure. that sparked you know whatever crazy you know like fans get so crazy about storylines I, I, you know the death of phoenix and i was just so into that so some of those covers are super iconic to me um as far as my own covers uh you know, it's uh, it's hard. To, you know, I I like the ones that people seem to like just because I see them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but there, every cover has a story. I mean, there are certain covers I've literally drawn. Actually, you know what? Now that I think about, it, I have still drawn covers on my lying on my stomach. There was one <laughs> in a train in France. I was literally on the floor in the train drawing. Um, I might have. Been Which still. one was that? Uh, it was a uh, divine right. It's a shot of. Uh, Chrissy Blaze with a gun. She's kind of turning, uh, looking over her shoulder at you. It might have been a variant cover. Yeah. Um, and uh, Batman Black and White with Batman with a Batarang with mm -hmm. like this bridge structure. I did that in a hotel in Berlin. I don't know why I was in Berlin, but I was, you know, that's what I remember <laughs> about that. Uh, you had a deadline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and you, uh, uh, there's uh, the uh, wizard cover that I did with uh, Alex Ross, which was um, Batman and Robin, mm -hmm. or not, uh, Batman and Superman. Right. Uh, and uh, that I did in Italy while I was living there for that year. And I remember riding on a bicycle towards FedEx. When FedEx is a small town, so FedEx was literally the size of, of your bathroom. It was uh, a, a sur uh, it was a parcel service that was in partnership with FedEx, mm -hmm. right? And they had weird hours. And I just remember riding with this big piece of board. It was a real large because he, he, you know, Alex wanted to paint on watercolor board, mm -hmm. and that stuff is thick and it's larger. He likes to work at a larger size. And I'm riding down on this bicycle on this big, I don't know if you've ever ridden on a bike with a large piece of paper, but it is, it is difficult. Yeah. And so I've got this, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> struggling to, to stay balanced because the wind is, is hitting this thing and I'm just going through the streets of Italy with this piece of art and I get there and make it on time for the deadline. So there's all sorts of, and there was another, when I was uh, working on X-Men, uh, Acts of Vengeance, I was living in Italy in a different city, and there was no FedEx in that town, I'd go to Florence, and so I had to take the bus to literally make my deadline. So it was like a th two-hour bus ride, and then the FedEx office was not downtown, it was outside of the town, so you had to take a taxi cab. So I would go into to, to, to Florence, I would draw, I was drawing the finishing touches on a piece. Yeah. It, it was winter, it was freezing cold, and all these like old Italian guys were like sitting around, <laughs> like as I was drawing on this cold marble floor, with cigarettes and, and you know, half cut off gloves and <laughs> just watching me finish this. And then I got into a taxi, went to the outskirts of town, FedEx this thing from Florence to uh, New York. It took like a week to get over here. I mean, it was, it was I mean, this is the 80s, so it was you, very you, different. You could probably do a comic or a graphic novel about your experiences you know, absolutely. of doing Absolutely. There was a lot of, yeah, you know what? It It is it is a challenge. I, I have FedEx from all around the world, and every country, every state is a little different. And um, yeah, adventures come out of that. <laughs> okay, so let's do some shotgun questions. First supervillain you ever drew? Uh, first supervillain? Maybe that... even when you were a kid, who knows? Oh, as a kid? Uh, uh, or anytime. 
I, Magneto is the one that comes to mind a lot, just because he, he was probably my favorite villain um, of, of all time, just because I was a big X-Men fan. Has the uh, your time spent in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, uh, influenced your artistry? Uh, it, it did initially just because uh, I was a big fan of Mike Mignola and Art Ams, getting to meet them, yeah. actually sleep on someone's couch. Uh, and, and uh, you know, if you look at my early Marvel stuff, it was very influenced by those two. Yeah. Uh, and I associate them with the Bay Area. So. Okay, so I have one last question from, sure. the, from the crew here. Have you ever drawn anything special for Carla, for your wife? Oh, all the time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, she, yeah. Can, can you tell us any? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, I, I have a sketchbook. This was actually inspired by, uh, you probably know the story, Jack Kirby had a sketchbook. That, for Roz. Yeah. For Roz. And yeah. he uh, filled it with all these sketches. Uh, I, I, wanna, I don't know if they were all female sketches, but there's different sketches that he did. And he gave it to her uh, on a special occasion. I, I can't remember. And uh, I travel a lot for business, and that takes me away from home. So I basically started a sketchbook that is my wife's, and I try to put something in there every time I travel away. And uh, it doesn't always happen, uh, just because, uh, just you know. But I've been uh, adding things uh, periodically over the, over the past two years, and so maybe eventually we will release it all somehow. I don't know. But, uh, you know, uh, I also draw her and the baby. I, you know, I have other styles I work in other than the superhero stuff. Right. Uh, so I'll do, like, acrylic paintings or just a charcoal pencil drawings and stuff like that for to put around the house. Um, we don't we don't have, you know, shots of the Justice League hanging, you know, in our, <laughs> in our family. Uh, as cool as that would be, she's not yeah. that receptive to it. But, uh, yeah, we have artwork I've drawn of, you know, our, our kids here and there throughout the house. Uh, and uh, then uh, the follow-up to that is uh, any of your kids showing artistic prowess? I, I, yeah. I, I seem to have seen uh, Little River drawing yeah, a few sure, things. Yeah, sure, yeah. They all, they've all drawn. Uh, and and um, that said, um, some of them show more aptitude or more determination than others, meaning that they will sit and draw almost every day, you know, um, uh, so all my girls went through a, a manga period, uh, anime, mm -hmm. and one really, uh, the, you know, the oldest one kind of drifted away from that, but really got into cosplay. So she's really into cosplay. She makes all her costumes from scratch. It's just amazing artistry that goes into that. So you can see how that initial passion for comics yeah. kind of evolved into something else. Um, the middle one uh, started with, again, with manga and anime, but she's really into photography now. That's her passion. The youngest one uh, is really into, to, she was not as much into manga and anime because she was too young at the time, but now she's like all about drawing uh, illustrations. She's on deviant art. She's got, uh, wow. she's thinking about going to um, a convention and actually selling some prints, you know? So yeah, I mean, you know, That's but, great. but all the kids, I mean, even the, uh, the step kids that we have are all into comics, uh, and, but just to different degrees. You yeah. Know? So um, I think it's yeah. kind of hard for kids now to not be into something that's related to comics. Be Absolutely, because, yeah. Because it's yeah, so deep sure, in the culture sure. everywhere. Right, and even if you think you're not into a show that's into comics, they still show up at Comic-Con yeah. you know, promoting. So, yeah. like, from Vampire Diaries to Fringe to to Revolution, I mean, these, to me, are not necessarily superhero ideas, but they're, again, in that kind of adjacent fan base, and they're all at Comic-Con, and and uh, it's just a celebration of, of all things that are that are... Fantastic, I think. Yeah. Really, more so than super heroic. Well, okay, we've gone on a long time here, a little bit longer than we probably uh, uh, designed to do that. So I want everyone to give it up for Jim Lee. Yeah. Thank, I want to. I want to thank you for being here. Um, this special edition of the Geek Speak Show uh, will be uh, online here sometime soon. Uh, I hope you all watch it again and uh, be uh, relive the experience. We're going to get the uh, the event started here sure. now, Fantastic. and we thank you so much, hey, Jim. Joe, thank you. This has been a tremendous pleasure. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Oh, uh, actually, this came in the mail. I don't know what it is. All right. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it may be really boring. Who knows? Huh. Probably just a uh... fan letter. Right. Okay.
said, I, I know chances are you won't ever read this. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to write and let you know I'm a big fan of you. Okay. This is weird. Uh, it's a, a, a girl that went to school with my daughter, and they were uh, a couple years ahead of her. So I, I think I've seen her performing because they were in a singing group together. Oh. Cool. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then. Okay. Get your comics out of their bags and boards. Yes, I hear the, the tape <laughs> yeah, snapping right, right, right now. Okay, and then this is for you. Okay. Um, this is, uh, well, it's self-explanatory once you open it up. Sure. It's, it's a uh, paper laptop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah. This is awesome, Joe. I can already tell, man, this is... There we go. That's from uh, from Comics Pro. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was the first one I was uh, as yeah. publisher. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It'd be fun to go through. Yeah, this is fantastic. This uh, kind of just is a trip down memory lane. <laughs> Maybe some pictures you don't want to yeah, visit, I know. but you know. It was fashionable back then to dress like this, I'm pretty sure, right? right? Sure, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. I'm like half naked in this one. <laughs> <laughs> my God. And that's why there was a line out the door. Yeah, no. I don't even remember where it's at. <laughs> I think that was one of those days where, you, you know, every once in a while you would just come out and hang sure, out and draw. Sure, maybe. That was, yeah. <laughs> well, when you actually have a shirt on, it's, it's sure. an official sign. Right, right, right. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Young uh, entrepreneurs of America. Yeah. And the necktie. <laughs> These are a couple of pages I got from you uh, back in the old days. Right. Still in my collection. There's Jenny back yeah, then. No, wow. <laughs> That's some pretty good sketches too. Man, wow. <laughs> And that was a free comic book day? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> I have a couple, of, like, uh, my, my, my family, my kids, and my wife have made, like, over the years. Uh -huh. This is great. This will be a nice addition to our library. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> okay. 